Hello everyone and welcome back to uh, EART 27201. So this is another set of videos looking at another invertebrate fossil group. This time a really cool group called the Echinoderms. You've probably come across these if you ever have spent time, for example, on a beach. And over the course of this particular video, as per, I'm going to be introducing um, the group and talking a tiny bit about their biology and where they fit on the uh, tree of life, for example. So. There are five major groups of echinoderms that are alive today. That includes the sea urchins, you can see here, uh, the starfish, which you can see here, the sea lilies or crinoids. I will probably be using those two interchangeably because a crinoid is qu quite a commonly used term. Um, you see an example on the right hand side here. Um, they also include uh, weird creatures called sea cucumbers. There's an example of these here. If I accidentally see, say sea slugs during the course of this lecture, that is incorrect. Uh, sea slugs and mollusks, these are sea cucumbers. And they also include the um, brittle stars, which you see on the top left here. So examples of um, these you may have come across include um, sand dollars, which are examples of uh, sea urchins. And indeed, I think probably sea urchins are the most familiar uh, of these groupings to us because they're easily found on basically any beach today. So the echinoderms are a marine only group. They only live in um, salt water. They're not good at dealing with, for example, fresh water. Um, all of them are equipped with a water vascular system. So we'll be getting onto what this is um, in a tiny bit more detail, but not that much to be fair. Um, sometime soon, which this this system, um, which is what it sounds like on the tin, right? It's a vascular system that's made of water, controls uh, tube feet. So these are um, feet that this the members of this group can use to manipulate food, for example, or move around. Um, all members of this group also include a skeleton that's made up of calcitic plates. And those calcitic plates have, when you look at them in detail, a um, thing called a stereome structure. So this is a, a kind of a sponge-like porous structure to the calcite that we really don't see in any other group at all. So those, those that combination of things, this water vascular system um, and the skeleton made up of calcitic plates with this specific structure are the things that unite this seemingly fairly disparate set of organisms. As ever, there are some exceptions to this, but bear in mind, uh, that is the kind of the ground plan for this group. This water vascular system I mentioned is unique. So it's really cool actually. Um, water is forced around a series of tubes, the plumbing, using muscular action. Then the, um, wa this, the water in the system um, it can enter and control the tube feet which extend outwards from the system to the exterior of the organism. And these tube feet are often modified for food processing, locomotion or respiration. So this water vascular system is a, uh, a key adaptation or key innovation of the group, and it's really cool. Um, most extinct forms and extant forms all have pentameral symmetry or pentaradial symmetry. Those two mean the same thing, but basically they've got five-way symmetry. They are diverse and abundant today and they're common in the fossil record because they're relatively robust. If you think about it, this calcite skeleton is fairly, um, is fairly, uh, has fairly high preservation potential is the word that I'm looking for. Perhaps between this video and the next one, I should get another coffee. So I am stumbling over my words less. Apologies. Um, today we can find sea urchins in many shallow water environments. As I've said, they're very common on the beaches. Um, brittle stars and sea cucumbers are common in deeper waters. Uh, often we will find uh, uh, the starfish in uh, scavengers on the seafloor. And the phylum as it stands today, so this is phylum, phylum echinodermata, these, these echinoderms, are generally split into two groups, the mobile non-stalked forms, that includes the sea urchins, sea cucumbers, and the two forms of starfish, and then a group that is mainly fixed and stalked. These are our crinoids on the right-hand side here. Um, a fun fact I discovered when writing this lecture that I wanted to share with you is that 
I, it's really cool. If you cut the arm, well, not for the starfish, if you cut the arm of a starfish, in some groups, they can actually regrow from the arm um, to create a whole starfish again. So naturally, uh, I, I then wondered what happened if you cut all five arms off, at, whether you would get five clones of, uh, of that same starfish. So I asked uh, my mate Imran, who also happens to be a uh, leading expert on the fossil record of the echinoderms, um, and he informed me that in theory, as long as each arm has a bit of the central disc that makes up one of these starfish that can regrow themselves, um, you could basically regrow five clones by splitting it into five. Isn't that cool? Not for the starfish, but you know, that's a really cool fact. Very useful for pub quizzes. So yeah, starfish are awesome, is what I'm trying to get across there. So that's a very quick overview of the echinoderms as a whole. Um, and they've actually got this wonderfully rich fossil record as well that goes back all the way to the Cambrian period. Well, at least. Um, not the, the, uh, Cam we have Cambrian fossils that definitely belong to this group. The, uh, the living uh, groups uh, generally arise slightly later than the Cambrian. That's a small modification to what I just said. So the things I would point out when we're talking about fossils, and we'll get onto this obviously in video three, as I'm sure you're well aware by this point, is that echinoderm skeletons um, tend to disarticulate fairly rapidly after the animal dies. They're kind of, their hard bits stuck together with uh, not particularly strong glue. And so it's very common to find skeletal debris of calcitic plates as opposed to the whole individuals, right? So these are common components of rocks, but normally bits thereof rather than complete individuals. Indeed, in some areas, um, these bits of, especially I tend to think of uh, within this context, crinoids are so common that you get entire beds made entirely or primarily of a kind of um, bits and pieces. A uh, particularly obvious example of this is a uh, beds called crinoidal limestones where, where the, the bits that make up crinoid stems, these are called ossicles, we'll get onto that in a bit, um, make up the vast majority of the rock. We do sometimes get um, sites of exceptional preservation. Uh, so examples of this are shown on this slide here, and these are starfish beds. These are beds that are characterized by accumulations of complete echinoderms, uh, normally through, for example, rapid burial of an entire ecosystem. Uh, these occur sporadically throughout the fossil record, and the examples um, that I've put on this slide of these fantastic UK Lagerstätten, those are, if you recall, sites of exceptional fossil preservation, are the UK Lynt Wardine starfish bed, of, which is found on the England and Wales border. So this is shown on the left here. These are late Silurian echinoderms within fine-grained turbidites, and you can see that the, uh, the level of preservation that you get on these is just beautiful, it really is. And another fine example is the lower Jurassic starfish bed that's found in South Dorset in England which is dominated by brittle stars, as shown on the right here, that were buried rapidly. So really nice fossils. So mostly bits and pieces, but in some instances, we can get whole echinoderms preserved. And those, those are pretty special, as you'll see over the course of the coming videos. As ever, I wanted to show you where these sit on the uh, Tree of Life and the Echinodermata, so this is our group that includes the starfish and the sea urchins, are deuterostomes. If you recall from our first lecture, this means that the first opening to develop in the embryo ultimately becomes the anus in the uh, grown-up animal, and the second hole or opening in the embryo forms the mouth. So that means that they're fundamentally different in terms of their development to all of the animal groups that we have seen so far over the course of these lectures. We're sitting here on the tree. The echinoderms are actually sister grouped to the hemichordates. We'll be meeting those a little bit in a later lecture. And those two uh, form a clade together and they are sister grouped to the chordates. So one thing I think is really interesting about echinoderms is that they are in part our closest uh, non-vertebrate relatives. So they're part of this clade that forms the sister group to the chordates, which is just mind boggling, I think. So this grouping of hemichordates and echinoderms is supported by both 
their morphology and by their DNA. So I, I feel fairly confident in that, hence me putting it on the tree. Um, I thought I would highlight that because it's actually, if you read older textbooks, um, that was quite controversial until maybe the last couple of decades. In terms of the taxonomy of this group, so rather than their evolutionary relationships, we're talking about their, their um, categorization. They are members of the phylum Echinodermata, which I could not fit in my box here, so apologies, I just put ek because, yeah, it was that or make the um, font smaller, and that was aesthetically unpleasing to me. Um, be aware that within the phylum Echinodermata, the sea urchins are a class called the Echinoidea, and we tend to, um, uh, paleontologists at least, um, use echinoids sometimes to refer to just the sea urchins and occasionally, um, probably incorrectly, to refer to this wider group of the echinodermata as a whole. So bear in mind that that's just a little bit, um, it can be easily confusing. Within this phylum, um, the echinodermata, there are five living orders, but 18 fossil ones. So there is significant extinct diversity within the echinoderms. There are more than 60 orders in total, and that includes um, ones that are only fossils and ones that are alive today. And there are around 7,000 living and 13,000 or so extinct species. Bear in mind that those are both estimates with actually fairly large error bars. I really struggled to find anything um, uh, that I was confident was, uh, was entirely accurate for those estimates. But that does show that this is a relatively species-rich and diverse group, certainly more so than, for example, the mammals. So that's a little bit about where they fit in the tree of life, more generally. I wanted to spend some of this particular video, though, talking about their tree, so the tree of the Echinodermata, because I think this really gives um, some good insights into the nature of this group, which is slightly unusual, and it's got this such a rich fossil diversity. So the relationships in the group, as I said, are really interesting. And I think especially those which are members of their fossil record. So consider this for context. We have a group of animals that we know started off as bilaterally symmetrical animals. They're a member of this clade, the bilateria. They have many of the features that we associate with that clade. They have a, um, a mouth and an anus and a fugut. They have the same embryology. So we're confident they're bilaterian animals originally, and they have now developed, evolved, pentaradial or pentameral symmetry. How did they do this? That means understanding this, or what is key to understanding this, is understanding both their fossil record and the evolutionary relationships within that fossil record, so we can see the stepwise order in which this interesting um, kind of biology evolved. So it's it's just crazy. How did this come about? Well, there is actually no single tree um, or single analysis which has all major living and extinct groups in it. So instead, what I've put here is a very large, as I'm sure you're aware, um, what we call a super tree. This is a, 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 an evolutionary tree that's made up by taking all of the individual trees um, from different analyses in different parts regions of this one big tree and then placing them all together into one overall tree. So this is different to, exa to for example, um, say building an evolutionary tree using all of these members um, as, as a, what we would call a terminal, as one of the uh, creatures here, and doing them all in one go. So this is made up of, in a bitwise fashion. And here you can see the echinoderms as a whole, including the fossil members of the group, with the five living members of this group marked on with these black stars. And you can see that what we have here is, um, is really sampling a very limited uh, grouping of an otherwise very um, diverse group. So th what we see today represents only a limited amount of their historical diversity. And uh, you may, it's interesting to note that many of these are now mobile, and many of the, the organisms that we've lost are those that are attached. That, that seems to be a pattern that we see in the fossil record of this group.
So we know, for example, that in between the major groups that were live today, we have all of these interesting forms that I'm going to be introducing in the next um, video. Uh, so these, for example, are called the blastozoans. And right at the bottom of this tree, where we may expect to see the group's origins, um, we have some non-radial forms that are now all extinct. And it's digging down into those that will tell us about how this group as a whole evolved this really interesting pentaradial symmetry. If we dig down into that, and this is a, a tree that I borrowed from, again, my mate Imran's uh, paper, which a paper he did with a, a, another friend and colleague, Samuel Zamora. It's a gorgeous tree and a gorgeous paper um, that looks at the origins within this group and their symmetry and how this has evolved. So during the Cambrian, the Cambrian radiation, um, we get some really weird forms of, um, of echinoids that were around at the time. And there were five groups around by, uh, in the Cambrian that were already pentaradial by this point. But there were also, around at the same time, some groups that were not pentameral. So we know that the uh, first echinoderms were bilaterally symmetrical. This is this group here called the uh, Tino, Tino Imbrugata. Bit of a mouthful, that one. Um, but yes, these were bilaterally symmetrical. And based on our current understanding of the evolutionary relationships of this group, the next groups to branch from that lineage went on to become um, the groups that are alive today. And the earliest branching members of the groups that were alive today were asymmetrical. These are the synctons and the solutes that you can see here. So Imran um, actually did his PhD on these creatures. They're really interesting um, because they are entirely asymmetrical. Uh, unlike the vast majority uh, of animals, they actually have no symmetry at all. An echinoderm type system will include things called ambulac ambulacra, which I will be introducing in the next video. Um, and the next, um, the remaining group groups to, uh, to split off from this lineage actually include these ambulacra. The first radial um, echinoderms, uh, which also have these ambulacra, are things called helicoplacoids. There's a, an example here. And these are actually triradial in terms of their body plan, and they have tube feet that are wrapped around a, a kind of a spindle-shaped body. Individuals probably lived with their shorter end, you can see here, anchored to the sediment. And then after this, we develop fully pentaradial echinoderms, the first group of these being the uh, helicocystoids, which have a mouth facing upwards. And that's kind of the origins of things that we would recognize as being like the echinoderms that are alive today. These pentaradial echinoderms diversified fairly rapidly from the start. Um, and indeed, if we look today, the most significant differences between groups are in the construction of the mouth and the nature of the feeding appendages within these pentaradial creatures. And that's true of the fossil record as well. So as such, based on this tree that I've shown you, it looks like in order to go from being bilateral as an organism to pentaradial, this group at least went through a period of having no symmetry at all. So they broke down the symmetry that was present um, and then built it up again to be pentaradial. Ironically, as we'll learn in video number um, two, yeah, video number two, um, some modern members um, burrowing forms have actually returned to being bilaterally symmetrical. So this, in that case, this is a bilateral symmetry over printing a pentaradial symmetry. So some really interesting evolution in this group. As you can see, um, these are, this is the diversity of the major groups of echinodermata that are alive today. I didn't put these extinct groups on because this graph would have been super busy and not particularly um, useful. These are actually the uh, groups that I tend to associate with fossils most commonly. You can see the major groupings all have their origins in the relatively early Paleozoic. Crino has got a bit of a jump on the, uh, the other two groupings here. So I've got sea urchins and sea cucumbers together as this red line here, a starfish shown in blue. Crinoids, as you can see, get off to a quick start and were massively successful in the Paleozoic. In particular, in the Carboniferous. Um, so there are, um, it, if you find huge amounts of um, bits of crinoid um, in a rock, especially in a limestone, and you don't know where you are in the geological column, odds are pretty good that you're looking at 
a uh, Devonian or more likely Carboniferous limestone. So crinoids are really common components in many Paleozoic sediments, and I've seen them in the field many, many times across the UK. The story of the other groups contrasts this slightly, as they seem to get more common, at least as fossils, as we move towards the current day. Echinoderms, that's sea urchins, really come into their own um, once you hit the Cretaceous and more recently. And you can see this, um, I've marked on this grey box of where they're useful as being post the Jurassic to reflect this. As you can see, there is no grey box at all for the starfish because these don't tend to preserve quite so well as fossils, and so they're not that useful at any given point. But when you get them, they're just gorgeous. So, that is the diversity of this group. Crinoids were smashing it during the uh, Paleozoic um, sea urchins more recently. It's a pretty good summary of what I just told you. And I wanted to finish by highlighting why I think this group is important. Why do they matter? So I've created a list of things that I think are, are important contributions by the uh, echinoderms to the world today. They are found globally and they're major components of many marine ecosystems. And in fact, they are vitally important to the ecology, the ecology of numerous animal communities within those ecosystems. Many of the adult forms are bottom dwellers, so they're benthic creatures, we call it, but juveniles can be pelagic, so they are floating or swimming in the water. And this means that the echinoderms are contributing to both benthic and pelagic communities. So they're important contributors to these ecosystems. Benthic communities play key roles in suspension feeding, predation, and grazing on this ocean floor, and some of them burrow. And this actually um, moves oxygen into the sediment, which is a very important function for those ecosystems. Starfish, um, as you can see in this fantastic gif from Finding Nemo, is actually relatively realistic, because starfish prevent the growth of algae on coral reefs. This is an important service for the health of those coral reefs. And they're also efficient scavengers of decaying matter on the seafloor. Um, so they're particularly, or I associate them particularly, with the Arctic. If you ever watch nature documentaries about Arctic um, uh, seafloor communities, there are loads and loads of starfish um, grazing on the seafloor, helping scavenge uh, decaying organic matter. Uh, Echinodermata, so members of this group, uh, form a staple part of the diet for many other sea animals, so they're important contributors in that sense too. They're also eaten by humans um, in many parts of the world, particularly in parts of Italy. If you've ever been there, you can actually get echinoderms to eat. Um, but that's, I think, to a lesser degree than they are food to other organisms. They've also got a long historical association with humans. So as I introduced in the first lecture, they've been found as grave goods in Bronze Age human burial sites. So clearly we have had relationships as a species with the echinoderms going back for, for a very long time. Other ways in which they can help us humans are sea cucumber toxins appear to slow down the growth rate of tumour cells. So there's lots of um, interesting research going on using sea slugs and sea slug um, toxins uh, within cancer research. So that's obviously really useful and very, very important. And finally, the hard skeleton of echinoderms is used in some areas as a source of lime. So farmers will often need lime for their fields. And when limestone is unavailable, um, the hard bits of echinoderms can really help provide that. So for all of those reasons, I think this is an important grouping of organisms that we should, uh, we should consider very, very uh, important to both us and to ecosystems more broadly. That was actually a, a surprisingly a long and in-depth introduction to uh, the echinoderms. Sorry that I went on a bit, but I think the Cambrian fossil record in particular for this group is really, really interesting. And I will see you again in the next video where we're going to be looking at the morphology or the anatomy of this group. So see you in a small while.